But let's um, let's start today. So I think um, Eric or Ning, why don't you um, you um, start it off with where you think we are, and then we have Paul and Hesu here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Joe. I think yeah, um, maybe where we left off in the last meeting um, looked like. Uh, Paul and Huisu, you had maybe some comments you wanted to share about the the pilot two submission that you referenced a little bit earlier in, in the year, but maybe if you have more detailed yeah. comments on how we can improve things or or the overall process, we'd love to hear it. Sure. Yeah, I have some updates. I talked to Paul yesterday what mm -hmm. we need to bring up. Um maybe I can share my screen and show some things here. Sure. So um, some of the issues that we identify is um, like, I believe we agree upon um, Cap and Maya plot is uh, interactive um, and other tables are static, but depending on the filter um, on the KM plot, for example, if we um, remove the plus zero, um, it changes the other other table. It's affecting other tables as well. So as you can see, oh. the plus zero, and then it's giving an error because of the number of column provided in header string does not match data. And then even efficacy data and it's showing this. So, we identify that depending on the filter in Cap and Meyer plot, the result of other tables are changing. So um, maybe that the things to be corrected. Yep, I will definitely work on correcting that. Thank you for letting me know. Yep. Sure. And then maybe a question from here. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I feel like that that may be intended for the TO framework because like people oftentimes want to compare different like uh, tables like using the same filter if they're looking for a specific subpopulation. I think when they design this framework, like like before, like basically there is a filter at every table. And then basically if you want to look at the same subpopulation, then like you don't need to do the click through like a right. page. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think in this case, like if we're we don't have the the filter for the tables, I agree. I feel like this uh, behavior doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to see if there's an easy way to turn that off for the other tables. Cause I agree, Ning, that's definitely the default that I've seen in my experimentation. So I'll have to consult the, the docs, uh, so to speak for TO and see well, if I can find that. Let, let's take a step back. Um, mm -hmm. We disabled the interactive plots for almost everything as a kind of special request. Um, right. For for this pilot, but um, hey Sue, for if we were if if you were to have everything enabled, would you would you um, think there's a feature that Ning just um, elaborated on makes sense? Is that the way you would want things to go? Uh, maybe Paul can chime in, but um, like as Paul mentioned, we don't want to endorse like subgroup analysis and p-value are changing depending on the um, like filtering things like that. So Paul, do you have any more comments to that? We, um, Teal, as was pointed out at the RN Pharma conference has some caveats associated with it. Um, and we do need to be careful of subgroup analyses. Um, I think we touched on that uh, previously. We have no issue with pre-specified, but um, we do have concerns about exploratory analyses suddenly being um, thought of as significant in some sense. Maybe to follow up on question. So if that's like we in the future, if we have a shiny app where we only specific pre-specified, we only deliver pre-specified analysis and there are maybe 
two graphs, and then there is a filter on the right hand side. You can choose ITT or a predefined subject population. Then, if in that scenario, like would you prefer to have the filtering like inherent uh, across different tabs, or you would prefer to do the click through uh, from tab to tab? Um, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Um, part of it is you no. Know, I guess we need to distinguish between exploratory analyses and um, ones that are used for inferential statistics. Um, the problem with exploratory analyses that produce a p-value is there's an inherent crossing of the line between exploratory and inferential under those cases. And that's the real concern. Um, and there have been controversies in the recent past um, that boil down to um, focusing on one subgroup in one study as evidence for approval. So, our concern is um, distinguishing between exploring data and using it for an a dis inferential decision making. Well, Paul, if I hear you correctly, then. Are you saying that you would never want an exploratory capability in something that goes through as a submission? No. I'm saying I, I want nothing um, interactive exploratory that produces a p-value. So... If we hid all the p-values, would that work? We can have um, all these graphs and no p-values? That was our initial um, response. Our management wanted static. So the, uh, all right, so I, I see you're fighting for um, some wiggle room here. But, you know, I think we could just not produce p-values um, well, anywhere. And then could we have all the plots interactive? Can I, Paul, before you answer that, can I just add one thing to Joe's comment there? Does that mean that we also shouldn't have confidence intervals? Effectively, it's the same information in one way or another. It's not emotionally charged the same way. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say um, there should be caveats listed. Um, you know, here we have the bar, you know, all of this is exploratory, right? I mean, yeah, see, so um, I think everything has to be viewed um, as exploratory from that perspective. Um, you know, a confidence interval, as Joe was saying, does not have the same, you know, essentially we're not doing a Bonferroni or a holm hochberg either on p-values or confidence intervals, right? But if we were to, you know, do this for, an actual inferential process, we would want such a thing to be considered. So well, maybe think... another question, like uh, you mentioned that if it's pre-specified, then it is okay. So I'm, I'm thinking in the scenario, if like we have ITT and subpopulation as co-primary endpoint or kind of like primary and secondary endpoint, in that case, subpopulation analysis is kind of like reasonable, right? But like for any undefined subpopulation, subpopulation analysis, that's questionable. Correct. 
So there are defined subpopulation analyses based on um, age, sex, ethnicity, race. Um, so there's some demographic ones that are pretty much required by law. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice in many cases, they might do even confidence intervals, but they won't produce p-values. And um, what we see as part of a submission. Yeah. Um, the issue is that trying to say we'll do a subgroup analysis, um, essentially it's can be a form of p-hacking. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great deal of sensitivity to that within our group currently. Yeah. So I guess to move forward, like my take is that like for this particular like uh, submission, I think that like uh, like uh, like if Eric can figure out like how to like uh, break the dependencies between different types, I think like it should be good for us. But for the future, if we want to further explore like the usability of uh, interactive tools, then you will be safer or you will bring less controversial if we like uh, limit it into pre-specified like uh, subpopulation analysis. If we want to have some interactivities over there yeah. it depends on how you bundle it mm -hmm. um so I, i'm thinking of the um line from spider-man with great power comes great responsibility um and that's a concern you know, when we have powerful tools, we have to endeavor to ensure that they're used appropriately. Look, can, let me, can I add, yeah. if, go on. Uh, thanks, Sue. Um, looking at this sort of exploratory analysis, I don't consider any subgroup analysis by age, race, thing, and all those that have been specified in the SAP as being exploratory. So we're looking beyond that. So if they are in the SAP, I guess there's less concern about producing confidence intervals or perhaps even p-values. As you say, Paul, often they're not uh, presented um, with those subgroup analysis. But the issue here is that if you go beyond what the SAP, uh, SAP states, then isn't that what this application should be dealing with? For for two um, for for one one principal reason I would say is that so say so that you don't end up with conflicting results or different results from what you submit in the main dossier. I'm not sure I entirely parsed what you were saying. So you're proposing, if I understand you correctly, to say that if it's done on the basis of demographic information that should be okay but um if it's done on the basis of other information that might not that would be a different sort of issue that would have to be discussed and resolved i think I'm going to think about um, the the demographic um, analysis is part of the SAP. So my my distinction is, has it been has it been pre-specified in the SAP, perhaps the protocol as well, or not? If it hasn't, then for me that sort of branches out into exploratory. So what's not been specified, I'm assuming, is what we intend this application to deal with. Um. Not entirely sure. I think, you know, if it's pre-specified in the statistical analysis plan, um, we have no objections, or at least I have no objections. Yeah. Okay, that, uh, okay, but but um, on a positive note, Eric may have already fixed the problem. <laughs> so um, my suggestion is, um, if that's the case, to do, yeah. we can declare a victory and move on. Um, yeah, it turned out there was an extra parameter that I had not changed from the default in the rest of the modules that I'm 
running through my uh, battery of tests now, but it seems to have solved it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, at least for this case, we can we have a path forward. But I think the discussion has certainly been enlightening for the future because I think this this particular topic is arguably one of the largest, I, mean, I should say, one of the most important things we should think about going forward for the feasibility of interactive mm -hmm. applications in general, ever shiny or not, and how they fit into a, a submission process. So I think it's good we're going through it. I'm just, yeah, luckily the solution wasn't quite as difficult as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, so um, if we can go forward with that, um, I would prefer, if possible, to defer um, a complete resolution um, of the broader issue, uh, what should be interactive and what shouldn't. Um, my feeling is that anytime we do inferential statistics, it needs to be pre-specified. -pre uh, Paul, um, let me poke at this a little bit because mm -hmm. I think we're we're what we're bumping up against are the internal procedures of the FDA. So, for example, if we did not submit a shiny app, but your analyst happened to have shiny uh, on the workstation, then then anybody could load it in and do inferential analysis. You know, independent of of the convenience, say, of us submitting the shiny, you know, uh, having the app in the submission. So it seems to me you're saying that, um, you know, these intentions are whether you're going to do an inferential analysis or um, exploratory is part of the intention of the analyst. And it seems to me you're saying these in, when you have one intention and when you have another intention are somewhat codified within the FDA. Um, I would even defer to the ASA statement on or special edition hmm. of the American statistician on P values. Hmm. Um, I mean, there's a extensive discussion of various circumstances um what we don't want to somehow seen as endorsing is a common practice semi-common practice in certain groups of quote unquote rescuing a i would again use the word air quotes failed clinical trial by torturing the poor data yeah um so we want to avoid that issue altogether. Um, to some extent, one sees, one can see that even now with tools such as Jump um, that clinicians and others can use that are interactive, but do not produce a fully open and transparent um, analysis trail. Um, in, when I was a reviewer and I had to deal with clinicians who said, I, I have this result in jump. And I said, well, okay, you know, did you enable some sort of diarying or ability to, um, replicate your results? Mm -hmm. Usually the answer is no. And then we have to say, you're planning to submit this to the journal of irreproducible results, right? <laughs> Um, so that's the problem, um, uh, with any interactive tool, um, we want it to be open. We want it to be transparent and we want it to be reproducible. Um, beyond that, we also want the tool interactive tools that we use to be consistent with good, um, statistical practices. And I would argue that an interactive tool that produces p-values on demand is not consistent with the ASA statement regarding p-values. I mean, there are some divergent opinions to that as well. But, but yeah, let, let's hold, hold that thought again. So, um, 
So what you're saying, Paul, first off, is that the ASA is pretty good foundation for us to reason about um, what might be consistent with FDA practices. So that's a that's a good foundation to start with. Do I read that yes. right? Yes, I'm um, considering that our office's deputy director is the current ASA president um, and a past president has been uh, Lisa Lavange, who was my supervisor at one stage. And I think it was under her uh, tenure that the statement on p-values came out. And there, there's not a there's there's room for discussion and interpretation within that but um one of the issues that that attempts to partially address is the so-called crisis of reproducible research um most no uh, there have been various papers that have said some proportion of published research is essentially irreproducible Yes, um, it is an industry problem. Uh, let me explore a little bit more. Um, suppose, though, this, um, like a fantasy here, but suppose that every time you went through a path of exploratory analysis in Shiny, it generated code to pr uh, reproduce that. Now, theoretically, mm -hmm. that would be you know, you would have these reproducible paths, it would be maybe impossible to use. Um, you would have that ability. Isn't that baked into uh, uh, Joe Chung's um, R, yes. was it? R shiny, shiny meta. Is what shiny you're meta. To. Yeah, right. we've been so, thinking so about that a lot in our company. Yep. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, you may recall, um, when we were discussing this earlier, um, I actually um, suggested that as a potential approach that ideally could be utilized. Mm -hmm. Would you say we should explore that in the future pilot as incorporating shiny? Meta I, I think that would be a great idea, but okay. that's me. I mean, that, that is an opinion for, of Paul, not the voice of FDA. Right, right. Well, I think we all can agree being able to take what an insight that either a reviewer or even frankly for those of us on the sponsor side generate with a powerful tool like this and be able to get a reproducible script to run that that same interaction, but in code, I think we all can agree that's hugely important. Like, I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I would hope that every tool has such a capacity. Me too. Now, I will say, and I don't want to get off on too much tangents, but I'm sure we have a lot more to talk about, but Shiny Meta is the most promising part in this space, but it's also one of the more difficult from a developer perspective to kind of shift an existing, existing app to use it. I'm mm -hmm. hopeful it gets easier to use, but I've definitely been talking to the Shiny team about its potential and maybe hopefully... Uh, improving it i th think there's kind of uh and we're dealing with this on our internal groups um it's relatively easy to design a pro prototype shiny right. app for for many purposes i, I mean that y yes even basic ones can involve a little bit of, um, shall we say, Anglo-Saxon terminology during the coding phase. But I think one of the key things is that um, Shiny makes it a lot easier and has um, more accessible to a much broader groups to develop apps and dashboards and the like. Um, moving into production, I think, is a greater challenge. Absolutely. And having something that is going from prototype to production, um, I think there's even a book out there on that. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or workshops as well, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> yes, workshops and books, and you know that's that's a major issue. And in some ways, um, 
part of that reactive programming and all of that is, I see that as part, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, you, you are much more knowledgeable than I am, but um, I see that as part of the entire, one entire challenge. Oh, yeah, I'm full agreement of that. Um, and there's a lot I can say about that space. But yeah, there are definitely some venues I hope to spread my opinions across as we go forward this year. Yep. So, um, yeah, so I, I would argue that particularly for various analyses, if they will be potentially used for regulatory decision making, it would be I would say essential that it have some sort of openness and transparency capability. Uh, shiny meta is definitely one path. There could be others. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Sam in the chat for, I think, referencing one of Teal's potential solutions to this. So I'm not familiar with QN or however you'd like to pronounce it. So I'd like to learn more about that. I don't know if Ning or others could share. Yeah, I, feel, I feel like they have been, the TO team has been making pretty good progress on that. I'm hoping the latest release, maybe we can like take a look offline. I think the record. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We're, we're running out of time. So, hey, Sue. Um, yeah, we can, we can move on to the yeah. next one. Um, and then the warning message. So I keep, I got, I found a constant warning message, which is this one. Um, I can still run the R Shiny app with this warning message below here. Uh, but we recommend using Tran or more curated repository for sourcing packages rather than like, I don't know what this is, but. Yeah, I believe that's for Teal specifically. Um, not to defer to Ning, but I think that was the installation instructions that I used from the GitHub repos to use that specific one um, for that. Yeah. And I think the team are also sent in, in the process of sending the package to Crime, but let me double check. Yeah, if it's on Crime in the future, it should be easier, I think, yeah. Yeah, that would be great if it's on there. Yeah. Our security folks are starting to make noises that they're going to crack down on packages. And we've been arguing that CRAN is curated. It's gone through the um, checks for malware, et cetera, so that we should not be worried about CRAN installations. Um, and we can even list an Oak Ridge site as one of the mirrors, for example, that we one would want to use. Um, we're not saying CRAN is the only option since we have other discussions, but you know, some sort of curated, maintained, updated, um, gar you know, at least some guarantee that it's been checked for malware and other types of things would be appropriate. Um, right. We have a, the whole, um, our validation hub is looking into standing up a repo for precisely doing submissions and this kind of thing. So, yeah, that's part of the reason why we were trying to say, come up with the idea of curated. Yes. Um, so I think if we can include those sorts of dependencies that in the long term, that's something that would help us with our security obligations. Great. And next point is, uh, um, so in filter, um, filters can be conflicting, I guess. So there are two, ADS, two data set, ADSL and ADTT, data set and there are multiple treatment variables like TRT01P, TRT01A, and here also multiple, I mean, several different treatment variable. And I was just playing around with this filter and like if I, 
uses to filter from two different data set and like if I exclude the placebo, but I can still um, include placebo here. And if I exclude the high dose things, like it giving us an error. So the user will gonna know um, it's giving an error and something was wrong, but maybe it might be good to uh, provide like a way to deal with this errors. Like, for example, if you exclude the placebo or giving us a, an error, like it has to be like the treatment filter should be consistent across tables, something like that. Or a warning you, message instead of just an error message. Yeah. 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 I mean, that that's the easier fix from my perspective instead of the cryptic error message that we we say there could be an issue with your applied filters um, or something to that effect. I'd have to double check within TO itself when you have multiple data sets filtered, what are the possible linkages between the two? If there's any additional help I can I can surface from that, I'm not sure, but I will definitely research it. Yeah, or is there a way to condition like the condition if you exclude the placebo there is no way to um include placebo in other treatment variable something like um something like that yeah i'll have to play with it a bit myself to see but certainly if if ning or others if you know of a, a solution offhand i'd love to hear it yeah so here these are one of the error messages when we yeah um, choose different like conflicting filters. So other thing is that um, Paul and I talked about maybe providing a readme file might be useful for the user or the reviewer because um, like list up the all the potential error messages, like how you like noted here, like so there when you run this code you can get the error message, but it's not gonna, like, it's not gonna prevent you from running the RHINF. So maybe providing a readme file that shows all the potential error message or all the guidance, like what you need to do um, to run the app prop properly. Would you prefer that being in this existing ADRG or like in the app itself, we have that you might call welcome or home page before you get to the actual modules. Would you like something in that or a combination of, of the two? I mean, it doesn't really matter how, okay. how you present it. Yeah, um, in some ways it might be good to replicate some of that information in the app just because um, access to the ADRG, um, yeah. you know, having the app be kind of standalone. Sure. Um, would be ideal um, if that is also decided to be replicated in the ADRG. Um, I don't think it's, we have objections to that. Okay, my initial thinking is we could have a separate tab called usage guide or something to that effect mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm, app itself. Mm -hmm. And that should hopefully take care of it for the most part. Okay. Does that satisfy your concern, Hesu? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's all uh, for so far. Yeah, that's all the issues that I identified. Other than that, um, it seems good, but I have to, um, I have to explore more, I guess. Um, so those are the potential issues that we identified. Thank you, Hisu. Maybe one quick question. Like I think for for some of the 
the the point of you you mentioned i think they're easy to address and for for example for the cron like for the error message about like a retrieving like package from github like if we couldn't resolve that like uh in the next month or so is this okay to, uh, to a pause point just wrap this up but maybe you guys can put a recommendation in your written response just saying that in the future like you recommend like putting package on cron or something like that so you may we wrap it up with the uncomplete. Like uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that like for the the warning message you mentioned where uh, it call out that like we are retrieving packages from GitHub instead of CRAN. If we couldn't submit a yeah, yeah. CRAN fast enough, then can we just put a, maybe you guys can just put a recommendation message in your response uh, instead of us waiting for the CRAN submission, right? Yeah. I think so, yeah, that makes sense. Cause so error message is just warning message. I can still run the iShiny app without any issues. So. Oh. I think so, yeah. Thanks. Do you think so, Paul, too? I think that's um, appropriate for a prototype. Um, if we were in a non-pilot production, it might not be um, quite as well regarded. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and obviously these pilots are illuminating these kind of issues so hence we're getting a lot of valuable input from seeing this in action from from what you are seeing on your installation side um so the good news is i fixed the the major filtering uh application issue now we'll we'll work on the usage and hopefully making those error messages either hidden or at least of a much more clear explanation on why those are occurring so, so this has been extremely helpful are we recommending that Hesu like pause in her evaluation until we fix these things we've identified? Um, what, what's the practical next step forward? Hmm. Some of you are frozen. No, I was thinking <laughs> um, if there were other <laughs> issues that don't depend on what we just discussed, I'd like to hear about them sooner than later. I don't think we have to hold up the rest of the evaluation for fixing these. Okay. Um, at least that's my opinion. What do you think, uh, Paul Hesu? I think the, well, if we can get um, an updated package and with um, those, it would certainly be helpful because okay. um, then we can actually we have to, the response, bef, um, our official response has to go through approval before it can be released. Okay. So if we can get, you know, a semi-formalized endpoint there with, you know, this is the, the final um, app. Um, and then we could write our, um response off that particular one that's mm -hmm. helpful so that people don't have to review responses multiple times sure yeah it makes complete sense to me so i think we'll have to coordinate much like we did in the first transfer a time when um i can't remember who we were working with on the fda side for the ectd actual transfer we'll have to coordinate something like that again so i might yeah. need some help with getting that lined up, but I'll certainly, I have enough information right now to work on everything we talked about today, at least. And right. Hopefully and get that. we found out the hard way that, um, basically we have to initiate a pull, um, okay. from a new submission. So okay. basically, um, with non prototypes, there's, once you, it comes in, it gets populated, and it's pushed out to us. Um, with prototypes and the t different types of environment, we have to say, we're interested in this. We need to have it pulled in. OK. Is, um, I think that's the um, final 
resolution we had when um, an email exchange, um, if I recall that correctly, is is that mostly correct, Hesu? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to do pilot two, take two. <laughs> If I recall correctly, pilot yeah. one also had a similar situation. Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay, so, <laughs> that's par right. for the course, then, isn't it? <laughs> so it does suggest that, um, yeah. Well, one thing is um, in the future is that it, iterations may be needed, um, and early submission would be helpful for iterations. Yeah, we were trying to kind of be in the middle there somewhere by having that hosted version of the app that you all could look mm -hmm. at on Shawnee Apps IO as a way for you to get that near real time, you know, mm -hmm. look at what we were doing in a staged fashion. But I do understand that you you need the more quote unquote formal transfer process to mm -hmm. actually do your evaluation. So we were trying to kind of mix the two yeah, together yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um so yeah and then things have evolved even since what we looked at initially you bet absolutely but my first pass will be to deploy a new version on the external hosting just to make sure it works okay. amongst our team here and then we'll send that link to you again just in case you want to poke at it before the actual transfer um okay well we'll take it from there yep well i have one more question do, do you expect that the the work you alluded to by the security team at the FDA will result in a formal document of some sort or in requirements or recommendations or? Um, so they might. We're in discussions with the, um, one of the groups I'm involved with, the Scientific Computing Board um, is, in discussions with um, our Office of Information Management and Technology. And there's some discussion of trying to set up a working group to, internal working group to address some of those. I don't think R is the main problem. I think it's actually Python. Oh, music to my ears. Um, well, I'm not an expert on Python, but I think some of their, essentially the equivalent of their mirrors were corrupted by malware in the past. Mm, that is true. It's a much bigger attack vector than, you know, CRAN has ever been and probably mm -hmm. ever will be. So there needs to be a lot more scrutiny around those things. So... My solution is just to say, hey, R, Cran, you can trust it. Python, eh. <laughs> um, but not everyone agrees with that approach. Right. It'll be short-lived anyway. They'll catch up. So we hope so. Um, let's see. We probably need to get going. We have a, a another... Uh, meeting, meeting to head off to. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, one thing we might want to flag is we're getting um, multiple groups approaching us now about using R in some sense, validation issues, et cetera. Um, we would prefer not to say that um, basically we, we might want to set up some sort of way of trying to resolve these across the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. I know we want to be decentralized, but um, it seems like there's a lot of replication and duplication of efforts out there. Um, and I didn't know, maybe that's something we're at our time that could be discussed at our next meeting. Yeah, I like that idea. The validation issues. Val, well, also, you know, who's going to do what? Um, we, we've been pinged on by Transcelerate. We're being pinged on by Fuse. We've been pinged on by Pharmaverse. 
Um, we would like to, at least I would like to have a coherent message and probably we need to broaden our base within FDA. Um, I've reached out to John Scott and Sieber so that right now we're, we've had a cedar based discussion, um, but obviously since we're using the same gateway, we would at some stage like to broaden it and bring in Sieber as well. All right, so the next time I, I will ask somebody from the validation hub to come. Uh, would be good to have them to the discussion. We could also invite people from Fuse, if you know who they are, if anybody can make recommendations. Okay. I think I, um, maybe we can have a discussion offline. Sure. Um, and we can forward and try to come up with an appropriate umbrella. Excellent. Okay. All right. So Paul, let me know when you have time to talk and I'll make myself available. Um, today's pretty busy, but let, let's uh, uh, touch base next week, perhaps. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Paul, I think everyone is waiting for us. Okay. Oops, sorry. Out. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. uh, sorry you. for the interruption to, uh, to get started, but you're all very resilient. And Eric, bye. you get the award for coding under pressure. So, uh, very you know. take care. Talk with you later. It, it happens. I've been through it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say for those that are still on, if any of you are attending Fuse Connect next week, come say hi. I'll be going on over there on Monday. For